Welcome to Just Asia, AHRC TV's weekly human rights program. To commemorate June 26, the International Day in Support of Victims of Torture, Just Asia focuses on the situation of torture across Asia. These are the headlines. Pakistan tells UN Committee that torture law is not required. Justice system defects encourage torture and other abuses. India fails to ratify CAT and enact torture law. Torture not in crime in Nepal. Impunity for torture in Indonesia continues. Torture institutionalized within Bangladesh's law enforcement. Welcome to AHRC TV's Just Asia. I'm Annie Lin. Beginning with Pakistan, the UN Committee Against Torture has condemned the widespread practice of torture in the country by its police, military and intelligence agencies. During its review of Pakistan's implementation of the Convention Against Torture last month, the committee called on the government to enact urgent reforms. The government, however, is claiming that it does not need a specific torture law, as the country's current laws are in line with convention provisions. According to the committee's report, Pakistani military forces, intelligence services and paramilitary forces have all been implicated in a significant number of cases of extrajudicial executions involving torture and enforced disappearances. While ratifying the CAT a decade ago, Pakistan pledged to change its laws to comply with the convention. Instead, it has enacted additional repressive laws, such as the Pakistan Protection Ordinance, which have increased the incidences of torture. The government's reluctance to enact a torture law is a deliberate attempt to support impunity for the law enforcement agencies. Just Asia speaks to lawyer Javeria Yunus to learn more. Torture is a systemic tool of oppression in a country where fundamental rights are a luxury. Despite its obligations under UN CAD to enact anti-torture law, the Pakistani government has been dragging its feet in promulgating such an act. The HRC has been very vocal on the conspicuous absence of the law and has been lobbying for enactment for quite some time. The states claim that the, that the framework exists to curb torture is completely baseless is, there is literally next to nothing in the law against the practice of torture or its perpetrators. Many death row inmates have accused police of, police of extracting confession through ter, third degree torture. Torture is a norm that is the beginning and end of judicial process in Pakistan, causing travesty and miscarriage of justice that in extreme cases causes death of innocent men like two brothers uh, cases that Pakistan uh, has also reported on famously called Ulam Brothers case who by the admission of court were hanged despite the appeal pending in court. Similarly, the Pakistan desk also reported on another uh, instance of classical case of dysfunctional criminal justice system, whereby three generations of a family had to pay the price for reporting the police excess of Punjab police. All they wanted was justice and redressal for the torture that they endured at the hands of the police officers. Police custody should constitutionally and ideally be the safest place for individuals and yet for citizens in Pakistan it is the most dangerous place. Deprived of all their constitutional rights, the alleged accuses at the mercy of his captors. Police interest and personal vendetta often make use of police to subdue opponents. The purpose of torture is therefore not only obtaining information, it is to inculcate fear in the hearts of their opponents. So, in, in under these circumstances, I believe that torture cannot be curbed as long as law enforcement officers have complete impunity in Pakistan. Next, in Sri Lanka, widespread use of torture continues despite the ratification of the Convention Against Torture. Although Sri Lanka has enacted laws for the prevention of torture, namely the CAT Act of 1994, the use of torture has not seen any improvement. Moreover, laws are not implemented effectively, as Sri Lanka's legal and justice system is fraught with administrative defects. The judiciary, prosecution and police all have serious defects. Despite UN conventions and despite domestic laws being put in place, people have no access to their benefits. As a result, people are constantly being subjected to human rights abuses, including torture. Just Asia speaks to Basil Fernando, Director of Policy and Program Development at AHRC, for more information. It is no longer uh, dispute that uh, in Sri Lanka, torture is widespread, 
it is very uh, used for everything and in fact only way criminal investigations are done is through uh, the use of torture. Uh, the problem as it has been pointed out is that uh, the government practically does not do anything. There is a law which uh, uh, against torture and it makes it uh, compulsory to prosecute and to punish a police officer or anybody who does torture for seven years imprisonment. But it is rarely that that law is used. Torture is happening every day, but the law is not used. Investigations do not take place, prosecutions do not take place, and even when it happens, a case can take about uh, 15 uh, years. Now we have about three cases. Where after 15 years court say that the uh, original court uh, has not, uh, you know, uh, uh, has acquitted these people wrongly and they should be prosecuted again and send the case for retrial after 15 years. Now, it is a it is senseless case must be decided in the shortest possible time and uh, he said uh, without undue delay. We do not have not only undue delay, but extraordinary delays, dramatic delays as one reporter has said, situation is extremely bad. But the government promises to outside agencies, UN and all that, we will stop it, but they are not really taking effective action. That is the issue that people should learn to address. In India, Umila Pulat, India Desk Officer at the HRC, speaks to Henry Tiffan, the Executive Director of People's Watch. People's Watch is an organization in Tamil Nadu, India, that undertakes a holistic approach to human rights violations and works on behalf of victims of torture. Henry Tiffan was awarded the Amnesty International Human Rights Award in 2016. Ms. Pulat spoke to Mr. Tiffan on the importance of June 26 and the ways in which People's Watch has commemorated the day. This year, the human rights situation in India was examined at the Universal Periodic Review UPR, process of the UN Human Rights Council and the subject of India's non-ratification of the UN Convention Against Torture was taken up as a concerted campaign. India is under fire for failing to ratify the convention and enact anti-torture legislation and this was the main focus of June 26 events this year. We uh, wanted to make, take advantage this year of the UPR and the UPR uh, assertions made by 41 countries to India uh, for to ratify the convention for a domestic law on uh, torture and for the uh, urgent invitation to the special rapporteur on torture to India. So what we did was um, quite early, about two, three weeks ago, we started a change talk about the uh, petition across the country, asking people to sign in, uh, and to be Prime Minister and uh, ask him to ensure that these mandates uh, are carried out in September when they respond to the Human Rights Council. Now, the two last organizations across the country, jointly or individually, according to what is feasible in their respective states, their locality, to observe the 26th of June as a day when we will be demanding be from, from Modi. And simultaneously reminding them that they will have to also force the MSRC to use the situation to remind Modi that these are urgent concerns on the human rights front that he has to attend to. And reminding him specifically that it was because of the MSRC pressure in the year 1997 that the UN Convention against Torture was signed and it is 20 years since they are signed and it is yet to be right this way. The discussion on the need for, for, for an anti special legislation and ratification of the convention has been renewed because of extradition concerns and the high profile cases that India has been involved in. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you think the state is uh, I, don't, I, I don't think I don't yeah. think I don't think anything was made to India with something else in mind. I think when countries communicated to India, they communicated straight that it was necessary for the convention against Tatu to be ratified. We cannot get into reasons. For whatever reason each country has a hand, which they never end out anywhere. Forty one countries unanimously have them ratified. Yeah. Forty one countries unanimously have them uh, enact the law, urgently, speedily. They use various adjectives. And the forty one countries said unanimously ensure that the special rapporteur is invited.
Moving to Nepal, police officers in the country continue using torture to further their own criminal intentions, such as obtaining a bribe or assisting politicians and elite, or simply because they were drunk and felt like beating someone up. Torture is also used as a way of social control of minority groups and as a show of power. Eight years ago, in May 2009, Nepal's Supreme Court directed the government to formulate legislation criminalizing torture. This was nearly two decades after Nepal had ratified the Convention Against Torture on 14 May 1991. Even though the 2015 constitution noted that torture will be punishable, torture is still not a criminal act in Nepal. Perpetrators continue to walk free and work in police stations with impunity. According to the Terai Human Rights Defenders Alliance, 2016 saw some 24% of detainees throughout 19 Terai districts suffer physical and mental torture. Torture undermines criminal and civil justice, without which there is no hope for peace and stability in the country. Nepal should therefore take this opportunity to clamp down on torture, revamp its government administration and redesign its criminal justice system. Next, torture is rampant in Indonesia, with the police being the most frequent actors of torture. In 2016 itself, 137 cases of torture were registered by the National Commission on Human Rights. It is unfortunate that many of these cases were not properly investigated or taken up. The AHRC documentation notes that police mostly torture victims to obtain forced confessions of crimes. This situation is, is perpetrated by an absence of public lawyers for poor and vulnerable victims. 19 years after Indonesia's ratification of the UN Convention Against Torture, the government has yet to enact a domestic law to punish torture. Moreover, although the president issued Government Regulation No. 92 of 2015, it does not ensure remedies for torture victims. In a recent case, where police officers of the Jakarta Metropolitan Police Office falsified evidence and tortured three detainees to obtain forced confessions of a crime, although the courts released the victims, the judges refused to grant them compensation. Just Asia speaks to Chris Biantoro, Indonesia desk officer at AHRC, to learn more. I think for the past decade, the problem of torture in Indonesia remains the same. Torture mostly committed by the police officer, and the pattern of torture crime is that uh, mostly to obtain for forced confession during the investigation process. For instance, the torture case occurred against three suspects of motorcycle theft in Jakarta Metropolitan uh, Police Office recently. The main problem is that the absence of any national law or regulation that strongly prosecute or punish torture as a crime under fair trial principles and in line with the International Convention Against Torture. The circumstances is worsening while the revision of the Indonesian Penal Code or KUHP has made only little progress in the last decade. Furthermore, the Indonesian Penal Code does not regulate a high standard of law enforcement and punishment against torture. It is limited under Article 1 of uh, Convention Against Torture overlooking Article 16 of the uh, Convention. This failure to broaden the definition of torture will make prosecution against torture difficult to be implemented in, in Indonesian uh, legal system. Therefore, we need to urge the Indonesian government and also parliament to promptly complete the revision of the penal code and ensure prosecution and punishment of torture. Moreover, the government should guarantee remedies for victims and families of victims of torture cases. Finally, Bangladesh's law enforcement agencies have institutionalized torture within their day-to-day -day operations. Policing, maintaining law and order, and conducting crime investigations all incorporate torture as an integral part. Victims of torture hardly get access to a complaint mechanism, while the police refuse to register complaints against its own personnel for committing such heinous crimes. The few victims who seek legal redress by approaching the courts lose hope as they experience a justice system alienated from the rule of law. While torture is constitutionally prohibited, 
and legally criminalized, successive governments and the law enforcement agencies keep using torture to maintain the status quo of power structures and the chain of corruption by the political, financial and bureaucratic elites. Any sincere intention to establish a torture-free Bangladesh requires deep understanding of the policing system and the capabilities of the justice mechanism as well as their direct and indirect relationship with the political culture of the country. That is all for this episode of Just Asia. For more on these and other issues, please visit www.humanrights.asia or www.alrc.asia forward slash Just Asia. Thank you for watching and see you next week.